Good afternoon. I'm very sorry that because of COVID travel restrictions, I cannot be there in person with you. Daily into the blue. Wish ourselves where things are named more clearly. The child wants to be a bus conductor or a confectioner. Seeks long journeys far away cake every day. That seems like real living. With animals, too, we dream we are big. The confectioner turns into a hunter in a strangely filled outdoors. Green and blue runs the lizard. Even the stones are alive, but do not run away. The philosopher Ernst Bloch declared that all given existence and being itself has utopian margins which surround actuality with real and objective possibility. And he wrote thousands of pages, from which I just read, in an effort to describe those margins, warning that every work which represents and informs this possibility is full of augmented horizon problems. These horizon problems bring us squarely into the problem of haunting. In this talk, I want to focus on those utopian margins, linger a bit on that wishing state where we dream we are big and the stones are alive and things are named more clearly. Another philosopher, Herbert Marcuse, once wrote that social theory is concerned with the historical alternatives which haunt the established society as subversive tendencies and forces. As I will try to suggest, although we are clearly haunted by the historical alternatives that could have been, and by the peculiar temporality of the shadowing of lost and better futures, that insinuates itself into the present, the utopian margins are a liminal place, neither a lost past nor an elusive future. The utopian margins are something else it's hard to describe, something more like a fugitive mode of living the what-if as if it were reality. We tend to think of the archive as a repository of memories, things, and documents from the past, or as a technique that turns or arrests the present into a past. But what kind of archive safeguards or keeps, com keeps company with or summons a past that the present hasn't yet caught up with? Can such a past or such an archive be summoned to haunt the present as an alternative? That's the question. I recently left my job as the keeper of the Hawthorne Archive and in that context, published a selection of items held by the archive. Letters, internal memos, reports, notes, conversations, images of various sorts, and other miscellany. The Hawthorne Archive traffics in the questions I've just raised. This afternoon, what I'll do is describe the intellectual origins of the Hawthorne Archive project, which says something about what I mean by the utopian. Then I will explain what I think Bloch meant by the utopian margins. And finally, I will return to the Hawthorne Archive. The Hawthorne Archive gathers the utopian histories and practices of those who have long challenged the modern racial capitalist system, but whose challenges have been obscured, including by the history of the utopian itself, a point I'll come back to in a moment. The archive houses, although it is not really a library, an incomplete and disorganized intellectual history of a somewhat but not entirely random selection of radicals, fugitives, runaways, deserters, abolitionists, heretics, dreamers, and indifference, all of whom at some point stopped doing what they were told they had to do, stopped thinking what they were told they had to think, and stop being available for things they had no design in making or controlling. I think it's important to say right at the start that the Hawthorne Archive is a very real place, and it is also an imaginary one. This makes it difficult to talk about because it involves moving between being inside its world and being outside of it, it involves keeping with the elements of its fabulation and also standing outside of them to speak of it as a project to you, in this context. The idea of the utopian margins is trying to get at this multiple world crossing, and the book's form as a set of archive files makes it easier to accept this while reading. But I ask for your patience, because everything here is a bit elusive. 
And in my opinion, if you fetishize or reify the utopian margins too much, it only becomes less satisfying. The Hawthorne Archive is real and an imaginary infrastructure for a writing practice that started off initially, now some time ago, with the purpose of finding some shared language for the utopian elements found in a variety of defiant activity in the past and in the present. The focus of the archive in the book that gathers some of its contents is a particular kind of political consciousness I call being indifference, and how this consciousness can be developed and sustained in practice. Being indifference is a political consciousness and a sensuous knowledge, a standpoint and a mindset for living on better terms than what we're offered, for living as if you had the necessity and the freedom to do so, for living in the acknowledgement that despite the overwhelming power of all the systems of domination which are trying to kill us, they never quite become us. They are only one condition of our being. The origins of the Hawthorne Archive, which is quite old, is a long story for another occasion, and the subject of some of the files contained in the first section of the book. The origins of my becoming its keeper began in the mid-1990s, when I became interested in redefining what utopian thinking and practice has meant and could mean if, for example, slavery, prison abolition, and the anti-debt movement were examples of it. This interest was instigated by two prompts. The first were some questions left unresolved in my book on haunting, ghostly matters, specifically with respect to what it meant to see the better life and the desires for it, what I called the something to be done that arises with and is carried by the ghost presence, to see the something to be done as characteristic of or constitutive of haunting, not separate from it. The second prompt was the irritating entwined triumphalism of the rights end of history claim made famous by Francis Fukuyama in 1992, and the left's claim that the political universe had closed shut after the failures of 1968. Both positions seemed completely out of touch with the remarkable wave of anti-capitalist resistance by diverse peoples across the globe, which remained invisible to many until first the Zapatistas in 1994 from the jungle in Chiapas, and then more widely, the Seattle WTO protests in 1999 woke them up. The rights end of history claim was also a, quote, utopian one, which went by the name globalization. The brave new fourth industrial revolution with its global assembly line, free trade, and boundless privatization, which dismissed any alternative notions of worldliness as Tina. There is no alternative. T-I-N-A, as Margaret Thatcher famously put it. The left kept to its Marxist-inspired tradition by dismissing much of this opposition as not realistic, but rather utopian. Herbert Marcuse called it the, quote, merely utopian, designating by the merely its managerial function. Both prompts suggested the need for a more capacious language suitable for what seemed to me a significant historical moment of political economic retrenchment and resistance to it. There were and are good reasons to distrust and even dismiss the term utopian, with its conventional meaning a future perfect no place imagined as a little nation engineered by white middle class reformers and peopled with homogeneous populations who don't have conflicts or complicated psychic lives. In my view, the main problem, however, was not so much the term's idealism and futurism as its deeply racialized historiography, a narrow set of literary, aesthetic, philosophical, historical, and sociological references. The Marxist dismissal of utopian socialism as nothing more than a kind of mishmash, as Engels put it, was only one intellectual origin for a notion of the utopian that treated the genocidal settler colonialism that founded the so-called New World as a successful utopian enterprise while absenting entirely 
what Peter Limbaugh and Marcus Fredericker call the many-headed hydra of the revolutionary 17th century Atlantic. All those slaves, maids, prisoners, pirates, sailors, heretics, indigenous peoples, deserters, commoners, and others who challenged the making of the modern world capitalist system. Thus, the utopian as we've come to know it includes the French and American revolutions, but not the Haitian revolution, or the 30-year war waged by the Black and Red Seminoles against the United States, or any subsequent Fourth World refusals. It includes Karl Marx, who absolutely hated the idea, but not Christian Preiber, who I'm sure no one has ever heard of. He was a German socialist exile who joined the Cherokee Nation in 1736, was captured by the British, and later died in prison, refusing to declare loyalty to the British. The utopian as we know it includes the English craftsman William Morris, but not the African-American worker, the self-named black Bolshevik, Harry Haywood, includes the philosopher Ernst Bloch's dreamy anticipations, but not the Caribbean writer and theorist C.L.R. James's philosophy of happiness. The utopian as we've came to know it includes numerous white middle-class separatist communities in the U.S. and Europe, but not one example of any instance of marinage, by which I mean autonomous runaway slave societies in the entire Americas, and so on. The examples are many. It is evident that there is an exclusionary zone of tremendous magnitude, and that these exclusions haunt the history of the utopian and what it has and hasn't meant. The primary purpose of the Hawthorne Archive, however, is not really to critique this exclusionary zone and tally up what's missing. Rather, the purpose of the archive is to so is to show something of what's in the space made invisible by its diagnostic frame. In other words, to show something of what's present in the blind field. There's always something or someone living and breathing in the place blinded from view. The question is what and who is there? There is another kind of utopianism in the blind field, although we almost never use the word utopian at the archive. This other utopianism, for lack of another term, has distinct onto-epistemological affects and finds its historical roots precisely in that exclusionary zone, and so in slaves running away, in marinage, in piracy, heresy, witchcraft, vagrancy, vagabondage, rebellion, soldier desertion, and in other often illegible, illegitimate, or trivialized forms of escape, resistance, opposition, and alternative ways of life. This other utopianism lends to the term utopian a very different meaning, one rooted more in the past and the present than in the future, and a different notion of politics, more eminent rather than transcendent. This other utopianism produces temporary autonomous zones that look less like the traditional rural separatist community and more like what sociologist Asaf Bayat calls the quiet encroachment of the world's urban poor, creating new life forms in the interstices of organized abandonment by the state. This other utopianism rejects individualization with its consumerism and embraces cooperation oriented towards what Claire Fontaine means by the human strike. This other utopianism creates feral economies based on not working as we know that activity as a means of exploitation, but rather based on local bartering, unauthorized trading, theft, and non-standard currencies that displace the productivist ethos most socialist traditions have favored. This other utopianism is characterized by both direct action against and non-participation in liberal democratic state politics by various forms of refusal, including the boycott and the occupation without demands. This other utopianism, in short, gestures towards an alternate universe or civilization long in the making, emerging out of and receding back into the shadows as needed, sometimes linking its varied 
traditions and strands in solidarity and fellowship, sometimes badly internally broken. The Hawthorne Archive is equally a mode of producing and a mode of representing, not so much the other utopianism as a scholarly object, but of what I started to call after Ernst Bloch's idea, the utopian margins. And it is to the explanation of the utopian margins that now I would like to turn before returning back to the archive. Apropos of rethinking animism today, the curator Anselm Franca writes, it is now clear that the modern arrow of time has changed directions. The future is no longer a white sheet of paper awaiting our projective prescriptive schemes and designs, and the past is no longer the archaic animus stage which must be surmounted. The future is now behind us, and the past approaches us from the front. This future is haunted, Franca suggests, by an, an by an archaic animus past which has now gotten in front of it. But what if the modern arrow of time was never modern, was never really a straight progressive line from past to present to future? Or what if it's not only the case that not all people exist in the same now, to quote Bloch, but that dreams themselves want to drift? Or still another way, what if there were always other arrows, such as Bloch's red ones, that carry the utopian surplus found in culture across time and place as if they had an agency of their own? About a different arrow, a blue feather arrow being made in the Amazon forest, Michael Tosig writes, It is as if the arrow is thinking, the methodical work of a magic at once technical and aesthetic. Yes, this is one way to ask the question, what if it is as if the arrow is thinking? What thinking does the arrow carry in its forward motions? In a little section of the principle of hope entitled Putting to Sea, Bloch writes, the will of the child and the adult fantasist destroys the house in which they are bored and in which the best things are forbidden, building in timeless history its mountain stronghold in the clouds or the knight's castle in the form of a ship. Here, I want to focus on this will and the situation in which the best things are forbidden or in which, to quote Bloch again, what exists cannot possibly be true. This will or willful spirit that Bloch feels certain is with us from birth appears in several guises that he names the not yet hope anticipation front or forward dreaming. For those unfamiliar with him, Bloch wrote thousands of pages attempting to produce in the form of a very opinionated encyclopedia of daydreams and other fabulations, including artworks, a philosophy of what his translators awkwardly call a living theory practice of comprehended hope, the unbecome, as it develops outwards and upwards. Bloch's project is exceedingly ambitious, a bit like a mad scientist experiment, and to me simultaneously beautifully poetic, completely incomprehensible, and very funny. So many exclamation points, italicized words and capital letters, and wild phrases announcing his political declarations and passionate attractions. Nonetheless, mixed into this mystical Marxist cauldron is something we might call a cultural theory of value. To be honest, I'm not sure how well this term holds up, but the point of the term isn't so much to analogize the labor theory of value, but rather to supplement it. You will recall that the labor theory of value is essentially a theory that explains the production of profit and the wealth and power accumulated by it as theft, theft of the worker's time, skill, effort, and soul. The simple version of Marx's labor theory of value is that the source of wealth generated in commodity production is the labor used to make that commodity. Because the exchange value of the commodity exceeds the cost of producing it, there is a surplus, and this surplus produces wealth for the owner or renter of the labor power. 
there are more sophisticated equations and further complications, and there are also other factors necessary for the private accumulation of wealth and power. Monopolies, rents, subsidies, financial instruments, state power, medias, armies, and so on. But all these involve theft as well. The problem with the labor theory of value isn't the general idea that private wealth is produced by theft. The problem or the limitation of the labor theory of value is its political function. Specifically, the problem is that Marxism and the left culture it has heavily influenced in this one way, at least, has historically insisted that we find in the capitalist mode of production also the values, terms, and the timetable for abolishing it and living differently. This requirement has been sutured to its long-standing stigmatization as utopian of any will to change that claims to come from outside the current epoch or outside the dominant mode of production or other than by capitalism's anointed historical agent, the Anglo-European working class. By contrast, Bloch not only embraces the wildly utopian, he also rejects the notion that culture in its varied forms is wholly circumscribed by its, what he calls, its transient existential basis and by ideology. Instead, Bloch proposes that something he finds in culture, hence the cultural theory of value, and calls a plus a surplus, moves above and beyond the ideology of a particular age. This surplus persists through the ages, even if the social basis and ideology of an epoch have decayed and remains, as he says, a substrate that will bear fruit for other times. It is a kind of promiscuous ghost, if you like. Bloch's cultural or utopian surplus idea is kin to the African-American novelist Toni Morrison's notion of those collectively animated rememories that are always waiting for you regardless of whether they belong to you or not. It is also kin to the Chemeranga Library's Pan-African Space Station, whose guiding question is, can a past that the present has not yet caught up with be summoned to haunt the present as an alternative? I take Bloch to be saying more than past ideals or dreams of a life without conquest, misery, exploitation, abusive power, enslavement, subordination, and so on persist through time. Arriving is always unfulfilled, the not yet, or as a kind of repressed pre-consciousness of what's to come. He seems to want to say that what is passed through time and across worlds by the red arrows is a surplus not merely the ideas themselves as ideas or tradition, but something excessive, something in excess of their mode of production, their imperfect realization, and their incompletion in their own time or later in the time we encounter or receive them. This surplus is concrete. It represents the actual better dreams and values held by people, and it also produces value although exactly how or whether at all it is to be calculated is unclear. There are no mathematical formulas for it that I know of, at least. I see the utopian surplus as the accumulated cultural archive of that qualitative difference Marcuse thought scandalous because it aimed at deep systematic change, or what he described as authentic liberation. Bloch is essentially talking about a living environment or culture, a kind of other world in which humans live, not always harmoniously to be sure, but live with utopian spirits or perhaps live concretely as utopian spirits. I repeat the Bloch statement with which I began. All given existence and being itself has utopian margins which surround actuality with real and objective possibility. Consequently, every work which represents and informs this possibility is full of augmented horizon problems. In part, these horizon problems arise from the liminal nature of the possible. That's to say, some of what's possible, 
let's just call it the surplus, has already been accumulated or summoned, is already here as real objects or in real subjects, and some of it is a not yet or an anticipation carried through time by red arrows, drifting dreams, and other kinds of ghostly forms. Bloch is looking for a philosophical language for this utopian surplus or these utopian margins. The search to give voice to this field of questions is filled with an understandable tension between what's present and what's absent, what's past and future, and what's historically material and what's idealistically possible. From Bloch's point of view, the greatest blockage comes from the fact that despite various efforts, there is something broken off about them, and thus what has been overwhelms what is approaching, he says, the collection of things that have become totally obstructs the category's future font novum. He continues, only thinking directed towards changing the world and informing the desire to change it does not confront the future as embarrassment and the past as spell. The treatment of the future as an embarrassment and the past as spell still, in my view, remains profoundly ingrained in anti-capitalist critical thought and political culture, even, as, even if Franca is right that the modern arrow of time has changed directions. Here, in Bloch's formulation, the future was always already in approach, not a blank page or a blank space. Bloch's challenge is to articulate a language for the better, more desirable future out of the existing or having existed utopian thought in practice he sees almost everywhere, in individual daydreams and in ordinary life, in literature, visual art, music, and popular culture, in political movements and theories, and in experimental societies and communities. Like many of us, Bloch struggles here with how to grasp or measure the degrees of separation from the past, including separation from the past tense of the degraded present we are looking to eliminate and leave behind. Clearly, the not yet has a past and is inflected by it. The future is also, Bloch says, in the past, in the sense of the kind of temporally discontinuous historiography envisioned by Chimarenga or the Autolith group, or perhaps more familiarly to this audience by Walter Benjamin. This is a temporally discontinuous historiography in which the past the present hasn't caught up to yet can be summoned in the future, and the future can also significantly change the past. I'll repeat that. This is a historiography in which the past the present hasn't caught up to yet can be summoned in the future, and the future can also significantly change the past. It is important to Bloch that the not yet, however much we can only access it through past or present forms, retains a certain degree of autonomy from the past and the present, and that we support and nurture this autonomy, not constantly try to undermine it with our fear of the unknown or our attachments to the past. The future not yet approaching forward dream is about the unbecome or the unbecoming becoming itself or to ease the anxiety this kind of thinking causes critical minds, we could say that the utopian surplus has its own surplus, its own excess, that spills over the margins or the borders we can see or access at any given moment. I think this is what Bloch means by anticipatory consciousness, a consciousness of a utopian destiny that is both in us and outside of us, zooming backward and forward, on the wings of red arrows. Locke's philosophy of the future is a phenomenology of the spirit that makes no peace with the world as already given. In what is perhaps my favorite sentence of his, Locke writes, it is a question of what things are in truth as seen by the star of their utopian destiny and their utopian reality. Bloch argues that we ought to replace the phenomenology of the spirit that makes peace with the world, as already given, with the phenomenology of change and the changeable that travels through the world in order to trace and advance what is not yet completely present in the world. 
what is not yet fully present in the world lurks in the utopian margins, inevitably a haunting and melancholy place. The drifting dreams of the more human are what Bloch called following Novalis the intractable blue. Flash and shine what is missing, the characteristic modality of a ghost. But he doesn't leave it at that. Always there's more here than meets the eye, the more leaving traces that produce the feeling, as Adorno put it, that something is really there, or in the process of becoming. Or as Bloch would have it, in the utopian margins, things are simply other than they are. In the utopian margins, the truth of people and things is seen from the perspective of the better we are capable of, that beautiful star of utopian destiny, not merely from the perspective of what we're told is necessary and inevitable and really real. In the utopian margins, there is an accumulated excess or surplus available to help like, make living more sustainable, more sociable, more anticipatory, and to help with the scandalous shape-shifting, the subject work and public works necessary for any change that will make a qualitative difference. The utopian margins are a liminal space where delicate and difficult crossings, transformations, and transfigurations take place. For the utopian margins are not only where we can see that things are other than they are, it is where we become something other than we were, where we develop new forms of life, where we grow what Herbert Marcuse provocatively called organs for the alternative. This is the point at which speculative thought seeks a foothold, Adorno cautions, or radical lo thinkers lose patience, and perhaps rightly so. But to find a foothold in the utopian margins may yield a stronger imaginative foundation than is often credited. For more than 2,000 years, Bloch writes, the exploitation of man by man has been abolished in utopias. In the utopian margins, stupidity has lost its privileges, and millions of people do not allow themselves to be ruled, exploited, and disinherited for thousands of years by a handful in the upper classes. In the utopian margins, the vast majority do not put up with being the damned of the earth, and revolutions outnumber wars and succeed in abolishing rather than merely exchanging the oppressors. No one is hungry. Work is not compulsory. Things are held in common and are distributed equally. There are magic tables, useful imagination machines, farming methods capable of growing healthy mountains of cheese. This was especially important to Bloch, as well as fairy tales and wonderlands and wishful times that sparkle. To be sure, the utopian surplus includes ominous seas of lemonade, copulating planets, great fetishes, maniacal orders, obvious lunacies, and a host of runaways, deserters, maroons, pirates, separatists, anarchists, revolutionaries, free prisoners, and other fellow travelers who come and go as it pleases them. The spirits that animate a non-capitalist life arise out of this great and ancient accumulation of excess, the utopian surplus, and constitute a collective intelligence gathered from struggle, or a subjugated knowledge that speaks its own language and almost always exceeds the contingent socioeconomic conditions and geopolitical locations in which it arises. Filled as it is with true stories born to quote Aimé Césaire in the great silence of scientific knowledge, many found only in disorganized fragments and only if one is prepared to imagine what can't be verified, the question of how to represent the utopian margins is a complicated one. That would be another talk. But I will try to say something about the question of form or method by way of concluding. For a long time, my intellectual work has involved looking for a vocabulary for the subjugated knowledge of slaves, prisoners, runaways, war deserters, and other fugitives and troublemakers many of whom have left few written records or, if alive, are difficult to meet with face to face. I have been trying to develop a writing practice and evocative language to hold this content respectfully. 
This subjugated knowledge is necessarily fragmentary and requires a certain degree of invention to put into writing, requires a method or a practice or a form that can carry the traces of the history that dismissed the knowledge in the first place forward towards something else, towards something outside of or extrinsic to the mode of production through which it appears to us precisely as marginalized and fugitive. In this book, the writing is neither fiction nor traditional scholarly writing as we know it, although based in both. The book consists not of chapters or of texts with surrounding images, as in a conventional artist book, but of annotated files organized in four sections or collections. In other words, the book itself mimes the archive format in its composition, organization, and design. Why then an archive? The simplest answer to the question of why the book takes the form it does is because I was stepping down as the keeper of the Hawthorne Archive, and after some discussion, we decided it would be useful to produce a selection of items for publication. The form of the book is self-evident in this context, although it gives an impression of the archive's orderliness, which is merely an artifact of editing and thus somewhat misleading. Another way to say this is that the book consists of an assembly of letters, documents, images, file notes, and so on, because that is the form in which most archives exist. So the argument of the book is made through the infrastructure of an archive. The book's material assembly, the layout, writing, images, cannot be avoided. If you only want to read the argument or the points, you still have to make your way through its mode of production, through the files and the file notes, through the various modes of classification and framing, through the non-bureaucratic archivist language that is delivered with some humor. The book forces you to read it as an artifact, as the kind of thing that might itself be an item in an archive. Of course, this begs the question of what the book's argument is, what it is an archive of, but I'll come back to that in a moment. The book's form reflects three other considerations that I'll mention. First, it is not a novel. The book traffics in fiction and fabulation, one might even suggest that the Hawthorne Archive itself is a fiction, a fiction of a particular alternative civilization. Recall Adorno's aphorism, what can oppose the decline of the West, he wrote, is not a resurrected culture, but the utopia that is silently contained in the image of its decline. This distinguishes the Hawthorne archive from conventional archives, even radical ones. And while it's true that the novel form haunts this book, it is not a novel. Everything in it is true, she says with a smile you cannot see. Second, this book was written over a long period of time and in small installments. Many parts of it were written in the context of working in the para-academic world of the arts and with artists, where there is an openness to creative composition, particularly at the border between the factual and the fictional. Thus, when people made requests of me to work with them, they made these requests to me as the keeper of the archive, and I responded in that capacity, returning letters, information, and items as requested. I am not the only author of this book by any means. Academic readers tend to see it as an artist book because it doesn't look like an academic book. I'm not comfortable with that description for many reasons, including that I am not an artist. But I do think that it might meet Amariam Joffrey's definition of artistic research in trying to open up, as she puts it, a fantastical space where imprecision, ambiguity, and contradiction, the very things that the natural or social sciences avoid, come into play. And finally, and most importantly, the Hawthorne Archive is a hospitable environment for thought, conversation, writing, invention, friendship, and political conspiracy. It's really not an archive in any conventional sense or as a project principally concerned with or about the archive as a place or as a mode of knowledge production. In its own world, that's very clear. The archive has a library, it has collections, it has members with memories good and poor, it has a society, relationships with other entities, a system of refuge, and so on. It's something different than what we normally take an archive to be. In fact, it is 
quite poorly named, and we are still trying to locate who exactly was responsible for adding the early 17th century word archive to what was more likely to have been the Hawthorne recorder, as that term carried the old meaning of bringing to remembrance from the heart through memory and story. It's also quite possible that Hawthorne was never meant to be a proper name as such, but was rather a direction or a misdirection for a secret meeting by the Hawthorne Grove later tonight, or ingredients for a recipe, two branches with adequate leaves and ripe berries for healing a broken heart or protecting the border to the world of the dead. In any event, the Hawthorne Archive holds a particular kind of evidence, not merely documents or material objects, but evidence of a different way of being. I was looking to represent those utopian margins as a mode of living, to treat the subject neither as an external analytic object, nor as merely dream, hope, or fantasy. In this sense, the archive apparatus, the letters and file notes and internal memos and so on, is a tool, one means for conveying a larger collectivity and a larger ongoing process bound by public and private relationships. It is a means for conveying an image of a community of intellectuals, artists, writers, and activists working and living in difference, of not waiting for another world, but of already being there. Being there is problematized in many ways in the book, including through the archive apparatus itself. The archive apparatus, then, is only an attempt, and perhaps a poor one, to convey a sense of other occasions, of conversations and solidarities unfolding, unfinished, points and lines and relationships to be developed going here and there, crossing wor worlds where we are, as James Baldwin used to say, better than what they think we are. And of course, that conveyance and world crossing doesn't really sound at all like this. To experience it, you have to enter the world of the archive yourself. I mention that I left the job of keeper of the archive. Well, as it turns out, the new keeper may not stay for long. They enjoy welcoming the runaways and coordinating with various friends and collaborators, but they don't like answering the kinds of queries we routinely receive. Exasperated, they keep forwarding the queries on to me, and I thought I'd share an example with you before I end. It's very brief. This is a letter from E, the current keeper. Dear A, an acquaintance of the archive sent a blurry painting by J. M. Turner from 1835 entitled A Disaster at Sea. It's not the famous one. This one is about the wreck of the Amphrotite off the coast of France in 1833. The ship was transporting a hundred odd women prisoners and a dozen children to New South Wales. Everyone on that ship with the exception of the captain and crew drowned. The letter writer wants to know, one, whether we have any information that might suggest that the women had organized a rebellion or a mass escape, and two, whether we could provide a succinct conjunctural analysis of this event they can use. Really, A, how did you have time for this stuff? Capitalism now lurches from crisis to crisis and is incapable of resolving them without ever increasing financial and military assistance from the state. The ongoing redistribution of resources from social property to private property in this context of enhanced militarism and securitization has led to more widespread social abandonment and more entrenched inequalities within and between countries. Their political systems are completely bankrupt and in shambles. And yet, the major capitalist powers in the West seem either not to understand or to be in denial about the decline of Western hegemony and the quiet but definitive shifting of the world system east. The widespread open political opposition, as well as the secret and more infra-political resistance to all this sends a lot more people our way. As more folks get shut out of participating in the existing economic and governing systems and see the Earth's sustainability failing, they are looking for real alternatives. Organizing, assistance, solidarity, fellowship, this is what we need along with stepping up the plan to encourage desertion, mutiny, and insubordination among the army and the police. I'm busy with the great turning of the wheel. So, 
If you could answer this letter, I'd appreciate it. I think you know something about the early prisoner trade and the Middle Passages. In the meantime, it would also be great if you would consider taking your job back. It's not for me. As always, E. My reply, Dear E, I think you have a pretty good understanding of the conjuncture in which we're living and the spaces of political intervention. I will look into the circumstances of the deaths of these women prisoners and let you know what I find out. Not sure about returning to the old job, but we'll see. As always, A. Thank you.